It's been said that everything we are or will ever be begins with a single drop of water, that each drop brings a sacred gift, and that as these drops accumulate to form streams, rivers, lakes, and seas, completing the cycle with returning rain and snow, life renews from year to year just as it does from generation to generation. Water means life for us all. Whoever you are, whatever you do, you and everyone you know or ever will know absolutely depends on a safe and reliable supply of clean fresh water. Maintaining that supply of fresh water that we all depend on for our health and well-being in the face of ever-increasing threats from overuse and pollution requires constant vigilance. A new threat to our water supply has emerged in North America over the last two decades that has the potential to forever alter our ability to access and use those vital water resources. That threat is the rapidly spreading invasion of quagga and zebra mussels. And our attention and vigilance is needed now to safeguard our life-giving water resources for future generations. Hello everyone, I'm Senator Dianne Feinstein, and during my time in the Senate, it's been a great privilege to work here in Washington and also back home in California on many issues that affect our critically important water resources. And I must tell you, nothing is more difficult. And I've sponsored many bills to help make certain our waterways remain healthy and vibrant, but now we're facing one of the most difficult challenges we have ever experienced in the form of invasive quagga and zebra mussels that threaten the very nature of vital water resources. And so there's nothing to fight over. We all agree these little mussels may look harmless, but in the following program, you're going to see the devastating effect they've had on water supply, on recreation, on agriculture, power production, shipping, and wildlife. They have also cost water users in the eastern United States billions of dollars over the past 20 years. Today, these mussels are spreading west with potentially greater impacts. There's no question we've got to stop them from spreading. So this is something that all of us need to take very seriously. Whether or not we fish, boat, or use our great waterways for recreation, these little mussels are dynamite. They will affect you and your pocketbook if they become established. Now, it's not too late to prevent these invaders from spreading, but if we don't take action now, these mussels will spread from one area to the next as hitchhikers, on boats moved on trailers, and equipment moving between waters. If you look at one of these mussels and you figure it can produce a million additional mussels a year, you begin to know the kind of threat that they are. This program will give you the tools you need to play your part in stemming the tide of this invasion to protect our economy, our ecology, and our great cultural heritage. Zebra and quagga mussels are two closely related freshwater species in the genus Dreisina, which are native to an area of Eastern Europe and Western Asia commonly known as Eurasia, specifically the Black and Caspian Seas. In their native range, these species evolved in an ecosystem that included a complete set of biological and physical controls that kept them in balance with their environment including predators, disease, and physical water quality conditions that limit their distribution and numbers. In the late 1700s, Dreisinid mussels spread to Western Europe when an elaborate system of freshwater canals were constructed to facilitate the transport of goods and services throughout Europe. Because this occurred before the peak of industrialization and included many of the biological and physical controls that kept them in balance in their native range, the impacts to Western Europe have been significant but manageable. Sometime in the mid-1900s, 
zebra and quagga mussels were introduced into the North American Great Lakes, most likely in the ballast water of a cargo ship traveling from a European freshwater port. The first reported finding of dry-seeded mussels in North America occurred when zebra mussels were found in Lake St. Clair in 1988. During the following decade, zebra mussels spread rapidly, principally by downstream larval drift, but also on watercraft and equipment to infest nearly every waterway connected to the Great Lakes, including the Mississippi and St. Lawrence rivers. And by the late 1990s, they were found in 23 states and two Canadian provinces, all east of the 100th meridian. Also in the late 1900s and early 2000s, a secondary invasion occurred when quagga mussels, which had represented only a small percentage of the mussel population before then, began to dramatically expand and by 2010 nearly completely dominate the dreicinid mussel populations of the upper Great Lakes. Since then, they have continued to expand their range, primarily by hitchhiking on trailered watercraft and equipment moving between watersheds. But it wasn't until 2007 that dreicinid mussels were found west of the 100th meridian, when quagga mussels were found in Lake Mead, and subsequently in downstream Colorado River impoundments and all connected waterways of the Colorado and Arizona aqueduct systems. In January of 2008, zebra mussels were found in San Justo Reservoir in Central California, and two adult zebra mussels were collected at Pueblo Reservoir in Colorado. However, while zebra mussels have become well established in San Justo, no additional adults and only a few villagers have subsequently been found in Pueblo Reservoir. Zebra and quagga mussels are relatively small freshwater mussels, ranging in size from just a couple of millimeters to a maximum size of about 5 centimeters, typically reaching sexual maturity at about 2 centimeters in length. While these mussels get their common name from the alternating dark and light bands that are often found on the outside of the shell, the pattern and coloration of both zebra and quagga mussels varies widely, often exhibiting few or no stripes at all. Both quagga and zebra mussels are similar in appearance and share the most distinguishing characteristic, the presence of bissel threads that are used to attach to any object of their liking. No other freshwater mussel in North America has bissel threads. The difference in appearance between the mussels has mostly to do with the shape and orientation of the two halves of the shell. Zebra mussels have a pronounced D shape, while quagga mussels have a more rounded shape and overlapping shell edge. This difference is not important. If you find any small attached muscle in freshwater, it spells trouble and should be reported immediately. Both muscle species reach sexual maturity at about one year of age, sooner in warmer and more productive waters. A single female muscle is capable of producing up to one million eggs a year with multiple spawnings. Fertilization is external and usually begins when water temperatures reach the low 50s. Fertilized eggs become free-floating planktonic larvae called villagers and remain in that state for two to five weeks while they accumulate calcium and develop a shell before settling on suitable substrate. Once settled, mussels are able to detach their bissel threads and move to find better conditions before settling semi-permanently. Zebra mussels prefer to attach to hard substrate, while quagga mussels do very well settling on soft sand or silt bottoms as well. Zebra mussels prefer near-shore areas in up to 100 feet of water, while quagga mussels are also found in very deep offshore areas to more than 400 feet. The typical lifespan for both species is 4 to 5 years, though individual zebra mussels have been found to live for more than 10 years in some cold water lakes. Dreicinid mussels are filter feeders, filtering up to a liter of water per adult mussel per day selectively consuming desirable phytoplankton that would otherwise be used by important game and food fish while avoiding less desirable plankton species, including certain types of blue-green algae, and then depositing waste and filtered sediment as pseudofeces to the bottom. Since dreicinid mussels can occur at densities of up to 100,000 or more per square meter in some waterways, this action completely transforms the ecosystem of the host water body. Thank you. 
Zebra and quagga mussels can have far-reaching and devastating impacts to water supply, power production, recreation, fish and wildlife, shipping and navigation, and other important economic, cultural, and ecological resources. It's been estimated that upwards of five billion dollars have been spent mitigating the impacts of dry scented mussels on water delivery infrastructure in North America since they were first found in the Great Lakes in 1988. And while no comprehensive economic analysis has been done to calculate the total cost of this invasion on the ecology and economy as a whole, most experts agree that its true economic impact is probably several times that amount. This is an issue that touches everyone, not just boaters. If mussels become established in your area, it will likely result in increased fees and taxes, higher utility and food costs, severe boating, swimming, and fishing restrictions, increased maintenance costs passed on to consumers, lower waterfront property values, and economic hardship for local businesses that service water-based recreation. It's imperative that we understand that as a natural resource, water is, is the, the basis for what we have here. Um, not only the recreation, but our farming in the south, um, the fisheries that we have, the tremendous fisheries in Idaho, and in the entire northwest. And this is not an issue that we can uh, look the other way at. It's actually, this is the last stand. Well, as we've seen zebra mussels enter our state and spread within our state, uh, there's been a change in attitude in how we look at things, where at first people just thought it was limited and localized sort of impact, and, but as we've seen it quickly spread, there's been some interest in trying to understand the dynamics of these populations. And one thing that's become quite clear is that no one uh, in, in Kansas is, is protected from the impacts of zebra mussels or other aquatic nuisance species. What we've shown um, is that the productivity in Lakes Michigan and Huron are about 80% below what they were prior to the zebra and the quagga mussels coming in. And in fact, productivity and the phosphorus levels in the lakes are lowest that we have ever seen since we've started making the measurements. So the ability of zebra and quagga mussels to completely transform aquatic habitats would be a huge problem uh, for just even fish passage alone, uh, changing the fish passage facilities to the point that they're not usable by these fish. Um, changing the habitat so that the food that they depend on is no longer available. Any one of those could be devastating for our native salmon and steelhead. The one thing that really frustrates me the most, and the, and the tribes as well, is that the, the threat of these mussels now represents a very large black cloud hanging over the basin. Um, we've had tremendous success in recent years with uh, resurgence in our salmon runs. Um, we have great programs on the ground to restore habitat but all that could be for naught if mussels find their way in and colonize the Columbia River system. Perhaps the best way to understand the impacts that zebra and quagga mussels can have on the ecosystem is to look at the changes that have occurred in the Great Lakes, where dry scented mussels first appeared more than 20 years ago. Zebra mussels were the first dry scene of mussel into the Great Lakes, and actually they became established in the 1980s. Uh, particularly, I think, first Lake St. Clair, Lake, Western Lake Erie was just huge populations were established. And then they spread throughout the rest of the lakes. In Lake Michigan, uh, zebra mussels were established in the early 1990s, and by the late 1990s had large populations. But in the upper lakes, Lakes Michigan, Lake Huron particularly, Zebra mussels were primarily found around the edges of the lake because they need warm water to reproduce and they need hard substrate. And that's limited in southern Lake Michigan and the like. So they had basically a limited distribution. Well, in the late 1990s, quagga mussels became established in Lake Michigan in Lake Huron, and they just basically took over. Now they're cold water adapted and can grow on soft substrates. So perfectly adapted for these cold water deep systems. And so they basically became abundant all the way across the lake, not just in a near shore ring. So you could go from like Muskegon where we are here, across to Milwaukee, 80 miles, and right now almost walk on a, a carpet of quagga mussels. In the near shore waters, the zebra mussels aren't just taking things out of the water column, but they're in a way intercepting things before they get offshore. So we have what's considered a near shore shunt of nutrients coming from the shoreline, coming from rivers that get trapped by the zebra mussels and effectively recycled in that near shore area. So in many near shore areas, productivity is actually increasing. You're getting more macrophyte growth, um, getting more bacteria that cause beach closures. 
The increase of these harmful algal bloom has been directly linked to the selective filtration of drycenids. These drycenids process a lot of water, whether it's quagga mussels or zebra mussels. And as they do, these big, large nuisance colonies, these harmful algae like microcystis cyanobacteria, are thrown out as pseudofeces. And so over time, these mussels remove all the desirable algae and they really enhance um, the uh, undesirable algae, the harmful algal bloom. So their abundance increases tremendously. The changes that they cause are not going away. They, they have caused you know, structural, physical changes in the lake bottom and water column where nutrients are in the system. So their changes are profound and likely to last a long time because of that physical change component. In the 1980s or 90s, if you would lower this white disc down to the bottom, you would see it down about 20 feet, then it would disappear. Well, this past couple springs, we have put this thing down over 100 feet below the surface, and you can still see it. In fact, like I said, some of the clearest fresh water on the planet where it was in Lake Michigan the last couple springs. One of the, the consequences of this clear water is the, that a lot of this productivity is going into the bottom and it's coming up on shore, causing great problems in, in some of the areas in the lake, in Lake, lake Erie, but also in the northern part of, of Lake Michigan and, and places that are typically thought of being quite pristine. The, the fisheries impact of the dry seas on the Great Lakes obviously is mixed. Some species have done well, some have not. But either directly or indirectly, um, the dry sea net expansion has been linked to the collapse of salmon in, in Lake Huron and the demise of many sport fish, particularly as you might expect, those that are dependent on planktonic food. I don't think anyone should argue that or would believe that if you have these huge mushroom populations, our fisheries overall is going to be beneficial. There are small segments that might do better, but overall it's going to be not good, and that's a problem. Because what you're doing is you're just putting most of that carbon energy into mussels, which you'd like to put into fisheries. In Lake Michigan, the estimate right now is that there's four times as much dry scenic biomass as there is fish biomass. And that's the problem. It's removing the food source for these wonderful fisheries that we have here um, in the Great Lakes. I mean, the, the salmon fishery and the lake trout fisheries in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron are, are wonderful. And there's a great um, economic base for that, great recreational fishing associated with it. Um, there's no food left for those fish. Some of the most troubling and costly impacts that dry seeded mussels have are those that affect our water supply and the infrastructure used to move water from its source to the point where it is used, including water diversion, conveyance, and delivery systems of all types and sizes. Once established, quagga and zebra mussels use their bissel threads to attach to trash racks, diversion screens, canals, pump stations pipes and terminal fixtures like sprinkler heads, storage tanks, and fire suppression systems, building up in ever-increasing layers that if left unchecked, eventually restrict or completely shut off the flow of water, burning out pumps and blowing out screens and filters needed to divert and deliver drinking, industrial, and irrigation water. From the time that we realized that we had a quagga mussel infestation in the lake, until the time we actually got the chlorine turned on, we began to have infestation in our infrastructure. We were taking apart um, small lines that go to instrumentation and finding that there were quagga in there. We were doing some physical inspections just as a result of changing out pipes and pumps, and we found them in that five-mile raw water line over to the River Mountains Water Treatment Facility. So we know that had we not put something in place to control this infestation that we would have uh, quite a bit of problem in our, in our infrastructure and that could cause us to go anywhere from it being a nuisance in some parts of our pipeline to potentially shutting off the water supplies. We're looking somewhere in the 10 to 15 million dollar range just to run the pipeline from the, the, where the intake uh, um, is being drilled all the way out to the point of intake. One of the biggest concerns with older facilities is they put fire protection systems in. And if you have a quagga mussel infestation, these fire protections are at risk for biofouling. We see them in every single water passage in the dam that uses raw water. HVAC systems, cooling water systems again, and then the Salt River Reservoir system feeds into our canal system, which has an arterial branching you know, canals throughout the Phoenix metropolitan area and that's what delivers the water to the water users and that is majority um, agricultural use, residential use and then the cities. So if the mussels get in they can impact the dams, they can impact recreation 
and they can also impact our delivery system and the canal system. This is the Columbia Basin project within the Bureau of Reclamation, a fairly large reclamation project based on water that we take out of the Columbia River. It's one of the larger projects that the Bureau of Reclamation has. We're currently irrigating about 671,000 acres in the basin. Uh, we produce anywhere from 60 to 80 major crops on any, in any given year. Uh, potatoes being one of the, the biggest uh, things that we do, an awful lot of alfalfa. We're one of the largest producing areas for, for apples in the world. The concerns that, that uh, the Bureau of Reclamation has with uh, establishment of the mussels in this area uh, are not so much in, in a big canal like this, but in the much smaller canals that we use to get water out of the big canals to all the farmlands. Those things keep getting smaller and smaller. Quagga and zebra mussels also cause some secondary effects on water delivery systems. Their filter feeding activity increases water clarity, light penetration, and nutrient transfer to the bottom that causes increased aquatic plant growth. In some cases, that increased nuisance plant growth has caused major problems to water intake and screening structures. Another problem associated with dry scented mussels is the increase in harmful blue-green algae that can create taste and odor problems for drinking water supplies. We are the major water supply for the city of Phoenix and the city of Tucson. Uh, blue-green algae would be a very bad thing for those municipal treatment plants because they would have to deal with the taste and odor issues from the blue-green algae. We've already seen the dramatic impacts that quagga and zebra mussels can have on the food web in aquatic ecosystems, completely re-engineering plant and animal communities and nutrient levels. Those changes can result in major impacts to commercially and recreationally important fish species and diminish overall fish abundance, size, growth rates, fishing opportunity, and catch rates. Well, as the, the quagga mussels establish themselves offshore in these high densities offshore, the, the uh, round gobies moved offshore and they've moved out now to 450, 500 feet, have large populations. They just followed their food out, okay? And they, they're, like I said, the latest estimate is somewhere between 10 to 20 percent of the fish biomass in Lake Michigan now is round gobies. Just phenomenal. So not only do you have more dry scenes in all fish, the one fish you got is one that people don't really even uh, like that much. Because it's expanding, it has definitely competed with the yellow perch. And the yellow perch is one of the primed uh, fish around here. We have documented a decrease in the abundance of some fish species. We have documented a decrease in body condition of some of our sport fisheries. And so zebra mussels are not a good thing for fishermen. Hatchery systems are also susceptible to dry scented mussels. When hatcheries become infested, fish production is either terminated or severely curtailed, resulting in a major reduction in the number and distribution of game fish available regionally. Well, we had uh, we'd fully renovated this facility uh, for trout production at a cost of about uh, over $10 million. Uh, shortly after mussels were discovered in Lake Mead in early 2007, we found them here at the hatchery. And at that point, we realized that the water supply that we had was infested with mussel villagers as well as, as other life stages. And we also had a full load of trout here at the hatchery, a full production. Uh, we had to get rid of those fish because of the potential of transporting mussels from the facility. Those fish could not be put anywhere but Lake Mead and Lake Mojave and then shut the facility down completely and did a thorough cleaning. This facility was designed to plug a big hole in our statewide trout production for sport fishing and uh, that represented you know, a third to almost a half of our planned statewide production for, for sport angling. So taking this facility off the table was a very significant impact and we just have not had any way to replace that. In addition, these invasive mussels promote the growth of nuisance and toxic algae populations that can affect swimming, boating, and other forms of water-dependent recreation. Colonies of living mussels and windrows of dead mussels can cover the lake bottom and beaches, making recreational use of these areas difficult, undesirable, and dangerous because of their sharp dead shells.
Lingbia on the bottom will accumulate throughout the season. By August, you, there are places where you will find you know, a, a fair carpet of it on the bottom. Um, then later on in the fall, what has happened is that washes up on shore and you know, can get meter deep accumulations of it in some places, depending on how the wind's blowing. So it's very unesthetic. And, and you know, shore, homeowners and people that use the shoreline really don't like it. Recreational boaters are also affected when mussels attach to the exterior surfaces of watercraft and clog internal engine cooling, raw water storage, and circulation systems, resulting in increased maintenance, operation, and repair costs. I think right now the biggest issue we have with the quaggas is people absolutely wanting to protect their boats. Um, we've taken over the hydro hoist business. People want to have their boats lifted out of the water to keep the maintenance down on them. They clog up all the water intakes into the drives and when that happens that the impellers get ate up and you'll lose a motor in a heartbeat. And it's not only fisheries, beaches and boats that are affected. Recreational docks, boat lifts and other equipment important to recreational boaters like navigation and mooring buoys can also become encrusted with quagga and zebra mussels, creating increased maintenance problems and decreasing the effective life of this equipment, making it difficult on commercial and recreational boaters alike. As a marina operator we see zebra mussels forming on every structure in the marina. They form underwater, around places where, where uh, people recreate. Increased cost to us as far as maintenance goes and the maintenance of all the marine equipment, cost and time, it just goes on and on and on. The cost if we were infested by zebra mussels, uh, probably the cost to maintain things would be a concern. Uh, some other areas that not only with the marina here, uh, but other areas of lake that the Clay County takes care of, the uh, golf course operates out of here, they have a water intake. If this lake was ever infested with the zebra mussels, we would definitely lose some traffic. Uh, it would scare people away if there was an area lake that was, you know, within 30 or 40 miles that, that did not have them. Uh, we would probably lose a few to those. Uh, I would hope not, because I obviously don't want to lose any of our customers or any of our, our slip holders, but uh, I definitely think some would choose to go another area if their boats were being affected by the lake quality. Because Lake Mead is a reservoir uh, and the lake levels do fluctuate, uh, one of the impacts to our visitors is, is also uh, visitor safety. Uh, we can typically see as, as the lake levels go down uh, uh, mats of quagga mussels uh, and that increases uh, calls to our rangers for medical services, uh, people cutting their feet. All of these recreational impacts have very significant negative effects on water dependent businesses, local economies, and waterfront property values. The health of the ecosystem in, in Lake Pend Oreille is, is key to the economy here. And invasive mussels would, would change everything, and I think it would leave our economy pretty well damaged. Our largest issues that, are, that came about after, after the zebra mussel find was the, the questions, the, the scare. Once the word got out, it spread pretty quickly that, uh, uh, you know, that all of a sudden Smithville Lake had zebra mussels. All power production facilities rely on water. Hydropower generating facilities use water to rotate turbines. Coal-fired and nuclear power plants require water to cool power generating equipment and for a variety of other critical functions, including fire suppression. Most power generation facilities in North America use water taken directly from lakes, reservoirs, or rivers. When those water sources become infested with dreicinid mussels, those operations are threatened. Maintaining a reliable water supply to these facilities when mussels are present requires elaborate and expensive treatment systems and near constant maintenance. Where a coal-fired power plant has service water only, a nuclear power plant has essential service water that is important for the cooling of the safety-related systems. We currently treat circ water for two hours a day and we treat service water for six hours a day. And those chemical costs right now are about $100,000 a year. When we go to 22 hours per day due to zebra mussels, that chemical cost will double. If these invasive mussels were to get in or established, uh, the costs at this project would be significant. Uh, the costs would likely affect our operation and maintenance. Primarily our maintenance would increase. Those costs 
would have to be passed on to the public in the form of rate increases. So looking at industry sources as far as uh, increases for retrofitting uh, dams, hydroelectric facilities that have zebra bacuaga mussels, it ranges from one to two thousand dollars per megawatt. So for example, here at the Portland District, if we look at John Day, the Dalles, and Bonneville dams, we're looking at around a five to ten million dollar increase. We now know about the effects that quagga and zebra mussels can have on the ecosystem and how those effects can ruin recreational, commercial, and subsistence fishing. But these invasive mussels can also adversely impact other fish and wildlife resources in a variety of less obvious ways. The link between the presence of dreicinid mussels and the increase in toxic algae blooms in the Great Lakes has been well documented. In the last decade, these toxic algae blooms have been responsible for killing tens of thousands of diving ducks annually. Because of the cladophora and the harmful algal blooms and the mussels, we have avian botulism going through the, the roof in many parts. Dead uh, um, birds all over loons in northern parts of the lake, all attributed to the mussels. So it's really been a mess. Um, and I think all of us would say not a good mess, uh, the mussels. I mean, I, to the people of the West, you do not want these in your lake, period. End of story. Zebra mussels have also had devastating impacts on native mussel populations in the major river system of the eastern and central areas of North America. Another major effect of a dreicinid mussel invasion in the western U.S. would be the impact that they could have on salmon and steelhead fish passage in large river systems. Mussels attached to fish ladders used by adults and bypass systems for moving juvenile fish downstream would increase mortality, possibly to the level that would curtail commercial, tribal, and recreational fishing opportunity and increase the number of threatened and endangered fish runs. Mussel impacts to juvenile fish passage systems could start right from the beginning looking at the submersible traveling screens. There's some additional screens that could be impacted. The bypass systems, the velocity is low enough that we could have settlement of villagers into these systems, as well as down here at the juvenile fish facility. The water is slow enough that we could have some impacts here. One of the concerns with invasive mussels for our juvenile bypass systems is anywhere that these mussels could attach that come in contact with juvenile fish, they are very sensitive to any rough edges, the sharp shells could cause a severe descaling of the juvenile smolts passing the dam. So most adult fish that bypass Bonneville Dam through the fish ladder system go through a small opening at the base of these concrete weirs that we're looking at. So the sharp edges of these mussels can get in these orifice openings or small openings and cause some severe cutting and injury to the adult fish passing those areas. Young salmon and steelhead migrate through the Columbia River system through a series of bypasses and fishways which have been built at taxpayer expense for many many millions of dollars, probably billions of dollars, and these bypass systems are not redundant. They're one-way valves, they're one-way plates, they're tubes that are lined uh, just steel pipes, plastic pipes, and if zebra mussels were to attach on the insides of these pipes and on these screens, the young salmon would either be smashed against the screens or cut up in the pipes, or even just injured enough that predators like birds and predaceous fishes could then find them easier prey. Another lesser known impact of dreicinid mussels is the effect they can have on shipping and navigation, including transportation locks and barge traffic. By attaching to the surface of locks and barges, zebra and quagga mussels accelerate the corrosive process and reduce their effective life. In addition, mussels encrusting the hulls of ships and barges plying North America's inland waterways cause increased drag and results in reducing speed and fuel efficiency. All of these impacts result in more money spent on operation, maintenance, and replacement, 
and when taken together, can cost millions, if not billions of dollars over time. So another potential impact at the facility in the Columbia River Basin is the navigation and our lock systems. So potentially we could get zebra mussels affecting the floating mooring bits. They could affect seals along the gates that would also impact uh, our navigation system. On average, I believe we pass around 10 million metric tons of cargo through the lock system annually. Our cultural heritage is rich and diverse. It values and celebrates the wealth of our abundant natural resources, ingenuity, hard work, active living, independence, and the great outdoors. It is closely tied to land and water resources and their sustainable use. And for indigenous peoples of North America, water, wildlife, and fishing are synonymous with life itself. Quagga and zebra mussels have the power to severely alter much of our sacred heritage for the foreseeable future if we collectively fail to meet the challenge to prevent any further spread of these insidious invasives. In addition to impact from a natural perspective, there's an economic, cultural, and social impacts that salmon losses would be mean to the tribes and the people of the Columbia River Basin. The tribes have been working very, very diligently over the last 30 to 40 years to bring salmon back. We're starting to see some benefits of that. We're making headway. We don't fish at times during seasons to make sure that there's enough fish that go through to, to sustain this, at least, at least a, on a, a ceremonial level or subsistence level for the next year. The loss of these fish um, from mussel impacts would be tremendous. Uh, many of the tribal members depend on fish for their living they depend on fish for cultural subsistence, and they depend upon these salmon as a religious item. Uh, salmon are the primary food at births, funerals, name givings, and without these fish available, these traditions are in peril. The key to preventing quagga and zebra mussels from expanding their range and disastrous impacts throughout North America is aggressive action. There should be no doubt that the benefits from preventing their spread far outweigh the costs of implementing comprehensive prevention programs that include outreach education, watercraft interception, early detection, and rapid response planning elements. Make no mistake, this is a preventable disaster, provided we are willing to act decisively and work cooperatively. So the real problem uh, with this problem um, is that there's very little we can do about it now. Once the zebra mussels and the quagga mussels have come into our system and have taken over in this, in this sense, there's very little we can do about it. So the only thing we could have done is prevent them from coming in in the first place. Nine out of the ten lakes that we have infested in the state of Kansas could have been prevented. Uh, someone brought zebra mussels to each one of those lakes. They, it was not through natural spread. And that's the interesting thing about zebra mussels. This spread is preventable. It's not inevitable that these will be in every lake across the, across the country. Uh, we just, it just depends on how much resources we'll, we're willing to dedicate to this issue. One of the critical issues that um, the general public can get involved with on prevention of zebra and quagga mussels is taking actions themselves. Um, this means cleaning, draining, and drying your boats. Government agencies do not have enough money to do everything that is necessary to prevent quagga and zebra mussels from spreading in the West. Therefore, all citizens, especially those that use recreational watercraft, fishermen, boaters, these folks have got to be on board and doing everything they can to stop the spread. We're all anxious to get in the water when we're on our way to go fishing. That's all that we have on our minds. But what we need to keep in mind, what needs to be top of mind, is that these fisheries are worth preserving and they're worth protecting. And once these mussels invade our waters, they're going to be everywhere. So spending a small amount of money right now on prevention is, is worth a pound of cure later. And so the inconvenience today is well worth preserving a fishery we might not have tomorrow. 
All I can say is don't move a muscle because there is just, they multiply so fast and prevention is going to be costing you way less than it would cost if you're going to have to keep up with the maintenance and we've definitely seen that. There's only so much money available uh, through these projects and so we need volunteerism. We, we, we can't emphasize that enough. It's vital that we have that. So anybody that lives out there on, on a lake or, or they recreate or they use those systems, uh, join your local lake association and, and participate and encourage them to, to, to do monitoring at your ramps, your boat launches. I really applaud the West for the way their attention they're putting on prevention and keeping the boats out. That's the way to go. You got you spare nothing to keep these muscles out of your legs, absolutely. Every individual and water-dependent enterprise is affected when zebra and quagga mussels become established because we all depend on water. So even if you don't boat, fish, or recreate on your local waterway, you need to be aware of this threat and do what you can to help prevent their spread and control their impacts on water supply, power production, food production, and the thousands of other things that we've come to rely on from a safe, reliable, and economical supply of fresh water. It's vitally important that the limited resources available to combat the muscle problem in North America be maximized. To accomplish that, all agencies and organizations involved in the battle must coordinate, communicate, and cooperate to the greatest extent possible. So the Fish and Wildlife Service largely plays a coordination role in zebra and quagga mussel management in the West, and, and that role is really important because we have um, limited resources and uh, so many different avenues that require work for preventing zebra mussel invasion, early detection, developing rapid response capacity, and uh, it's critical that states, other federal agencies, tribes, um, the private sector are all working together and all on the same page. If you're a boater, seaplane operator, or water-based equipment provider, you need to take direct personal responsibility to thoroughly clean, drain, and dry your watercraft and equipment between uses. If you're a water resource manager, you need to implement prevention programs to safeguard those resources and encourage and support your neighbors to do the same. And even if you're only a food, water, and power consumer, you need to encourage and support dry seeded muscle prevention and control efforts through your elected representatives. Minimizing the impact of these invaders on our lives and pocketbooks will require a team effort. Please do your part and stop aquatic hitchhikers.